So if I'm not feeling really good, like I was in the moment prior, I, the, the, the go-to usually is like, Oh, what do I need to do to keep this up? Uh Oh, what's going to happen? Like, I'm not feeling good anymore. Well, I just, I just use the moment as my frame of reference now, instead of what happened before or what's going to happen. I just use this moment. So I'm like, Oh, that's fine. I got this moment. Oh, okay. And I, and I, and I can ax that one too. I can see that one too. So it's very, it's getting easier to, to really kind of like, like, let go of my sword, so to speak, to put down my sword. It's like, oh, okay, all right. There's nothing to fight here. No, no, no worries. No big deal. Everything's fine. And so I just use the moment as my frame of reference, and it's it's awesome. It's really, really awesome. Um, and another thing that that is happening is I'm seeing that I can zone in on like the nanosecond of the moment. Where it, it's it it sometimes feels like everything That's is a bit grandiose. A bit grandiose. Well, I mean, nanoseconds you don't know. Well, maybe you not nanosecond. Nanosecond. No, nanosecond. Like okay. I'm not speaking technically say here. Split second. Okay, I'm not second speaking technically space, here. I, I, I'm speaking like with the spirit of what I'm saying. I'm I'm not I speaking know. technically. Okay. But um, yeah, it's like you're. It's well, like so. It's so zoned in. That everything is going like really fast and really slow at the same time. It's really cool. Mm -hmm. And it's like what what I find is that there's like no thinking, there's no problems, there's no worries when any of that is happening. And there's like a deep relaxation that happens. And then I'll get like some energy sensation, not energy sensations, but unfamiliar sensations going throughout the body. And um, yeah, I'm just just letting it all be, enjoying it. Uh, there's a couple of points to make. One of them, just a side point. Fast and slow <clears throat> is really relative. Just like Einstein was talking about, space time is relative. Let me give you an example of that. Uh, you are four feet off the side of the uh, railroad tracks and a train of unknown and unspecified speed comes by. But here you are because you're only four or five feet away from the tracks. That means you're actually one or two feet from that train as it's going by like that, right? You cannot, it going so fast, cannot see any of the writing on the side of that train. If you pull back a hundred feet, you can read you can read what's on the side of the train, but now the train is not going nearly as fast as it was before. And if you pull back a mile and look at that train through binoculars, it's crawling. Mm. Mm. So that means that it has to do speed has to do with the observer. Mm. And so um, the closer we are to stuff, the faster it seems and it's and, and it's uh, oh, oh, too much. Mm. But if we begin to get some distance, it's not that the train or the mind slows down. It's that we can see it because we're getting some distance from it. But when we mm. are the mind, then it's lickety split. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're my thoughts. Mm -hmm. So that's an important point to recognize that um, uh, that by slowing down and getting some distance, we can actually see things that are moving faster mm. than, than before. Mm. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, so, it's it's interesting. It seems as though what I'm seeing when that phenomenon is happening is I'm seeing the the experience prior to identifying with something or or prior to this is me or this is an opinion or this is like prior to identification i guess is what you could say it's it's like it's like unlike <laughs> anything ever <laughs> i have my eyes like this <laughs> i'm like some kind of crazy man but really i'm just 
vibrantly alive in, mm-hmm. when that happens. And I can do it willfully. I notice I can control it. So I go, I willfully go into that. Like, oh, okay. I, I just, oh, I relax. Oh, it's just the moment. And then when I, when I focus more and more and more on this moment, it's like, whoa, <laughs> it's like rushing. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, um, first off, congratulations for the fact that you are making some progress. And not only that, but others on Skype and uh, uh, on the uh, comments are <laughs> noticing that you're making some progress. The progress that you're making is typical, but in fact, uh, because I've got some distance from it, I can see, see you as that slow moving train coming down the track, <laughs> but other students are very much closer to their tracks. And so they're seeing things go lickety split. <laughs> okay. So it's a matter of one's perspective and with the perspective uh that i've got i want to congratulate you for actually beginning to uh make good progress thank you don Morado. and and that um a lot of what is going on is in fact that whole idea of the rules and getting it right according to the rules Mm -hmm. And that it is absolutely <laughs> sorry. Is that it's absolutely mind blowing to recognize that so many of the rules that each one of us has accumulated over our lifetime are contradictory, wrong, sometimes upside down, and actually um <clears throat> While the intention is to take us to a good place, the rules wind up being the the good intention that is the highway to hell. Hmm. Hmm. Right. Um, and that a, a very clear example of that, uh, but there's many hundreds of them, but this is kind of uh, one of the biggies is if you don't work, you don't eat. And yet in any particular generation throughout human history, that was not true. It's not true for most, let us say, million people, and people are beginning to figure that out. Because of the COVID, they were out of work. And most of them, in fact, very few people starved to death for the two years of COVID. Most of the people who died didn't die of starvation, they died of COVID. And most of the reasons that they died of COVID is because they could not give up that you got to work, you got to eat mentality. Mm. So, in fact, the got to work, got to eat kills a million people. (laughs) (laughs) And almost nobody starves to death. Mm. So you're saying because people people worked while they had COVID rather than giving themselves time to rest. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And look at how many people didn't go to work. Right. And they were fine. <laughs> that when you're in the work environment, in fact, um, uh, safety and security are rarely the issue. Money making is the issue. And why is that? Because of that baseline rule, if you don't work, you don't eat. And so we have fear of uh, not doing what we're supposed to do. So in the practice now of Anapanasati, uh, one of the things that you can start to become alert for is the rules, because all of the rules that you've been keeping and making has what's kept you in some regards not moving even faster than you could have, because every time that you um, let us say here to hit a roadblock that roadblock is actually um a rule that you've made for yourself mm-hmm. like you're supposed mm-hmm. to do this or you're supposed <clears throat> to do that and one of them would be that oh now that i've got this bliss i'm supposed to keep it yes exactly yeah when i'm I supposed to keep you it can't do that yeah 
Or you also, can't, or it's also, a that able I, to be developed, but yeah. you turned it into a supposed to. Yeah, but it's it's interesting because like what I'm noticing is when I do that, I end up disappointing myself. Like right, there right. ends up being great exactly. disappointment, great expectation. There ends up being like the ditch. But if I cut it there and I see the thought, oh, I'm supposed to do this and see the worry of going down that spiral and it could be like, oh, gotcha. I got that mm -hmm. one. If I can do that, then what I can then what I'm left with is like a grain, a little grain of worry or a little grain of concern. Oh, what, what, what do I need to do to keep up this? It's a little grain as opposed to this big mountain and that grain becomes so insignificant when I take the next breath, when I enjoy this moment, when I acknowledge myself for the seeing of that success. I'm seeing more and more and more through the illusory nature of, of like the stickiness, illusory stickiness of these thoughts. This is one of the reasons why I keep coming back to that silly little phrase. There's nothing to it. There's nothing to it. There's nothing yeah, to see, it. Yeah, see, it was great big when you saw it, but now it's become like a grain. And uh, the grain, yeah, there's nothing to it. Yeah, and what's interesting is, like, even though there may still be that wanting for that bliss, I can still see that, too. And here's the thing, right? By comparison, I would rather have a grain of wanting than a mountain of wanting. So that grain of wanting... Why, even though I want to get wanting, get rid of wanting altogether and I want my bliss, okay, sure. But if I can accept that grain of wanting and say, hey, this is good enough, I've already won. Okay. I've already won. That's actually what you're now speaking at is um, basically the introduction would be from Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa says, um, two phrases that are deeply interrelated in the sense that it's the same phrase. One, he talks about a mind that's fit for work. And the second one that he talks about is wisdom at the point of contact. Now, these are actually the same things. One is actually referring to the first jhana, and the other one is referring to what to do in first jhana. Getting the mind fit for work is then the first jhana. An example of that, an easy example, is reading an article. Is your mind fit for reading that article? Most of the time, no. Most of the time, the mind will wander around while we're reading an article. It's not fit to stay focused. And so the other side of that is wisdom at the point of contact means at this moment, is your mind fit for the work of looking at the uh, the way that our thoughts that are formed contact us for feelings. That in fact, we're talking about in the Paticca Samuppada, Salayatana, Pasa, and Vedana, which is right there in the middle. Okay. <clears throat> now, uh, the Salayatana is the result of perception. In other words, when you perceive something, what is the result of having perceived? The answer to that is it's a mental object. It may be a concept. It may be uh, um, visual. It might be a sound. But that, and it may be also extraordinarily fast, or it may be ruminating and slow. That in fact, that's one of the things that most under, misunderstand. They think that when they hear about the teacher Samapada as being a sequence of events, that some people think that it takes hundreds of years for that one cycle to go through, and others think that it that it no, it happens quickly split, one step for a tenth of a second, one step for a tenth of a second, right, like that, very choppy and very very fast. But the reality is, is that sometimes we get stuck in perception for quite a long time. And then what we can keep coming uh, up with in, while we're in perception is we do perception again and again and again, and we always come up with results that are confusing. In other words, we haven't figured it out. We don't have the answer. And that contacts us 
And so we spin. In other words, we're not taking any new input. We're just trying to refigure it out <coughs> and refigure it out and keep coming up with no solution. <coughs> this gives rise to a different kind of feeling. That so there's actually uh, according to the suttas, three kinds of feeling, and according to Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa, there are four kinds of feeling. And so let's talk about the first three and then how the fourth one fits into place. And that is, is that when we uh, are impacted by something, it's going to push us into one of three kinds of feelings if we do it ignorantly. If we are wise and we can choose how we're going to feel, that's the one that Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa says is the fourth kind of feeling. And most people would say, well, there's ignorance and then there's wise, which means that if there is ignorant, greed, ill will, and confusion, then that means that there should be wise greed, ill will, and confusion. And that's not true. When you have wise feelings, then you can feel the way that you want to and behave wisely according to it, rather than be driven by either the greed, the ill will, or the confusion. Now, the point here is, is that in the suttas, this confused kind of feeling is either referred to as a sukha, a dukkha vedana, or sukha dukkha vedana. And almost always, because of Western bad translations, they translate this as a neutral feeling. And guess what? A neutral feeling means that something didn't contact you and you have no feeling. There's nothing to that. It's not a neutral feeling. It is you don't know whether you like it or not. It's a confusion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that confusion then almost always leads into um, let us say it has the propensity when there is no wisdom, confusion goes to fear, uh -huh. Uh -huh. which also is ill will. So ill will is automatically ill will and confusion. In other words, if you see, let us say that you're an army officer with binoculars and you're looking down below into the valley and here you see some people on horses coming. And you do not know who those people are. They may be cavalry or they may be war Indians on a war path, but you can't see who they are. Right? What are we going to do? We're going to keep looking and keep looking and keep looking until we figure out who they are, right? Why? Because that feeling of confusion has the quality of danger. They might be dangerous. This is instinctual that we have that quality of when we are confused, we think that it might be dangerous. If we don't know what it is, then it might be dangerous. We've talked about this before in the sense of paranoia. Whenever we have confusion, if our attitude is, is that if I don't know, it might be dangerous, then that almost always happens. Okay, so let's look at another one, and that is greed. An example of that greed would be somebody wants a car, and so he's got to struggle to do the things that are necessary to get the car. Never mind why he wants the car, he wants the car. Now that he's got the car, he wants to keep it, he wants to maintain it, he wants to use it, he wants to pay for it, he wants, he wants, he wants while he's got it. And then either the car crashes, or it breaks down, or it's stolen, and now he doesn't have the car. And again, he's pining for the loss of the car. The car was never the issue. Always the issue was he wanted before he got it, he wanted it while he had it, and he wanted it after he lost it. Wow. That is a real wow, because that's something that we do not understand and we don't like it because we think that if we like it, it must be good. 
And here we're saying, no, if you like it ignorantly, then you want it. And because you want it, that wanting itself is dukkha. So all three of these Vedana create dukkha. Ill will is obvious dukkha. Confusion becomes ill will. And now we're seeing that greed also leads to dukkha. All of these feelings lead to dukkha unless they are wise feelings. And if they are wise, when we wake up to the feelings that we have already started, or we wake up as the feeling starts, then that means we can choose to feel the way we want to feel. And since you've been starting your practice and talking to Dan and I, what has been happening is you've been following the set of rules and wounding up feeling according to whether you passed or failed your rules. Mm -hmm. well, recognizing mm -hmm. that you have a choice when you are wise about how you're going to feel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm seeing. Yep. Okay. So where do these rules come from? These rules come into play when we make something up, when we are imagine something, when we build a concept, when we have a thought, when we perceive something, we perceive it with dragging up all of the stuff from our past, including those rules. So you build the rules in and that's how we actually perceive things is because of the rules. And so therefore, your uh, the thing that you come up with, your result has the rules built right into it. All right. And now the what's impacting you is not what you actually observed, but it's the rules that you perceived into it. And so now you're beginning to recognize when those rules show up in your perceptions. And so that means that now when those perceptions hit you, they don't have the weight that they did because you're well, you're wise to the way that those, oh, that's just the rule that has been made. And that's why I wind up wanting something. Mm -hmm. Like you, I mean, why? Here's the, the funniest question that I can possibly ask any student. Why meditate? So the answer want, is because you're suffering. I want freedom. Why are you suffering? Yeah. Because you want something that you yeah. don't have. Right. Okay. Mm. Mm. Why are you suffering? Because you want something that you don't okay. have. Yeah. yeah. And here we're practicing, according to the Buddha, of practicing now to become satisfied. In other words, now we're beginning wisely to take control over our feelings so that we can like things the way that they are without having to follow a rule that I've got to go get it. Yeah. All right. So this is, in fact, where the self comes from, is it comes from both the instinct of uh, the, the moment of fear arising in a situation. <clears throat> but then over time, that selfish position with the rules gets stored in the mind that is now used for the new perception. Mm. OK, I don't know if this example will help, but uh, those who are computer scientists will really appreciate this story. And that is there is a, a whole area of computers and pattern recognition that would call that would be called optical character recognition. IBM started that system with the post office way back in the 60s. And that's why they started requiring all business letters to be typed so that they could have machines to read the envelope and sort the mail rather than having 10,000 people with 10,000 boxes running on roller skates the way that they did in the 1930s, right? They've got machines they can read envelopes for sorting for, right? Mm. Okay. Now, on our laptops today, we have printed text on a piece of paper that you can put into a scanner 
And from the time that you press the button to the scanner a few moments later, you can actually see that text on the screen that can be edited. But we can't edit the uh, uh, the image. So how do we get the image of the characters on into text? The answer is the software we're talking about optical character recognition. So you take the image and you scan it and all you've got is pixels and they have to go through and and find what is the character and then they have to go take that character and look in the database. And the database that they look in will have a lot of different fonts. And in fact, most of the OCR software that runs on a PC will actually use the TTF files out of Windows as the font. As their first set so that they will know how to read those characters. OK, this is exactly the way that the mind works, that we're trying to make sense out of or be able to read this image as text. And so after we get the character in the mind, then we've got to search through the database to find all the, let us say, the letter C. And so you recognize the letter C, regardless of how vented or shaped or, or distorted or whatever it is, you can still see the text to C because you've got so many different letter C's stored in your mental database. And this is actually how we read. But we make we take the words off of the page, put them into the eye. The eye then will take that and each character then, as we're little kids, when you're six years old, the kids don't remember the alphabet. We've got to implant that stuff deep into the mind. Right? While you were planting A, Bs, and Cs in your mind, you were you were planting a whole lot of rules also rules about living rather than just rules about alphabet, but all of this stuff is just a set of rules. Okay, and if the child doesn't follow the rules while he's writing, he'll be up on the line and down on the line. He'll put a Q instead of a P. He'll put an E that looks like an A, et cetera, like that. And then, in fact, I know a lot of adults who says they can't even read their own writing. Why is that? Because they're not following the rules. So what we have to do here is to figure out what rules are there that's worth following because many of the rules that we have set up wind up getting us into trouble. An example of that is the child learns Cyrillic and then he comes to the United States and now he's trying to write, but all the, all the letters that he remembers are the Cyrillic letters. You get what I'm talking about? OK, so this is exactly what happens with us as humans is, is that the alphabet that we learned, the rules that we learned as a child don't apply in the in the current situation. And one of those heavy duty rules that's been given to the kids is you don't work, you don't eat. I mean, look at how often that rule is impressed. Every time the child writes the letter A and is asking, why do I have to do this? It's because he's following the rule that you've got to get an education because you've got to get a job because you've got to work. Because if you don't work, you don't eat, right? So that's how deeply that rule is buried into our reality. And so here the Western student brings that rule into meditation. Oh, if I don't work at this, I'll not get anywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that is ordinary effort. You could even say it's ordinary right effort, but it's not noble right effort. That noble right effort is to throw the rules out. And get back to some very, very, very simple rules. Mm -hmm. And so the rules that I make are the same rules that the Buddha made. Very simple rules. And that is Dukkha, Dukkha Naroda. Mm -hmm. Is there Dukkha right here in this moment? Which means that I'm dissatisfied because I'm not living up to some rule. All right. So. That's the new rule that we can follow is, is that it does not matter 
<clears throat> what's going on at all in meditation or otherwise. The only question is, is am I satisfied? Because satisfaction is the exact opposite of the dukkha, which is unsatisfactory. Dissatisfying. That's all we're looking for is just being satisfied. And one of the ways of saying being satisfied would be, I like it and I'm satisfied with just liking it. I don't want it. And so your average Dhamma dude will be out in public and they'll see women dressed in various um, uh, stages and whatnot like that of makeup and clothing. <laughs> and they like uh, the image because the women are working hard to create that image. They know exactly which, um, uh, let us say, testosterone buttons to push. And then the Dhamma dude likes what he sees and then he feels bad. You should not like that because he's got a rule. Mm -hmm. But a better rule would be, wait a minute. I like it. There's nothing wrong with liking it. But if I want it now, that's where the dukkha comes in. The dukkha comes in not with the feeling itself, but it comes in with the clinging and the grasping that ignorantly follow the feeling. So I noticed this with my girlfriend a lot. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so if you don't know the answer or if you were confused, the uh, wise confusion is to just get more information. Go back to the source. Let's get more input. Rather than worrying about what we don't understand. Okay, so uh, trying to figure it out, I guess, is what we're talking about here. Like trying to figure out how to not want it? Anything. Try to figure mm. out anything mm. when, in fact, all really is going on is we don't have enough information to figure it out. But you're following a rule. You're supposed to figure this out. And basically, the rule is I do not like how I feel when I can't figure it out. And I want to feel good. And the answer to that is you can go ahead and feel good without figuring it out. And you might have been, in fact, figure it out when you get enough input data. And so just patience, that will help us to feel good. Mm. Rather than that confusion that's driven us, oh, I've got to get an answer to this because I don't like not having an answer. Mm. Because if I had an answer, then I would like it, and then I could feel good. Mm. Okay, so this is the whole quality of learning how to treat our feelings wisely. Is that you can, in fact, have the feeling of confusion, and that's absolutely satisfactory, that you don't know what's going on. Or there is the issue of ill will. Or let us say, um, here's a really easy example. Um, this comes out of the Vinaya. I don't go, let's not go too much detail into the, uh, the various aspects, but there was a monk who was a cousin and kind of a half brother to the, to the Buddha. His name was Devadetta. And like most of the people in the Buddha's family, he ordained also. But he remained very jealous mm -hmm. of the Buddha and wanted to take over the Sangha. And the Buddha <clears throat> would not allow him to do that. But in fact, it was several points of confrontation that even David Detta tried to kill the Buddha on three different occasions and missed. But and we can see that in the, the process that the Buddha had ill will towards what David Detta was doing. And he criticized him royally, just like he's criticized other monks. Things like you don't have a uh, shred of wisdom. You have mm. no clue about what you're talking about. So the Buddha being a bull, can you imagine that, that, that people sometimes get really knocked over 
by the power of the Buddha and his not liking. Mm. Okay. So the Buddha also had not liking. He had liking and he had confusion. There was a lot that the Buddha didn't know. Mm. But that was okay with him. <laughs> because he knew enough. Mm. In our society, we have the idea the more the better, the more the better, the more you get, the more money you get, the better, the more wisdom, the more knowledge. And people sometimes have two, three, and four PhDs. Yeah. Okay. The more knowledge, the better. Well, guess what? Knowledge as far as science, religion, and archaeology, and many, many things of science, et cetera, like that. Politics didn't even exist in the time of the Buddha. 90% of all the knowledge that's taught in a university, probably more than 90%, didn't even exist in the time of the Buddha. But mm -hmm. what he did know was sufficient to have a happy life. So this is another way of looking at it is, is that we have uh, a rule that says the more we know, the better. Not true. It's just a rule. It's a rule we learned in childhood that we don't need to know very much. What we need is to know enough. And what is enough? Enough to be satisfied. Enough to know that this is dukkha. Mm hmm. Exactly. Enough to know that wanting something you don't have is dukkha. You can like it, but you don't have to want it. So like what a good example of that confusion that we're talking about, right? If you don't necessarily, obviously, whatever that is that revolves around the confusion, you don't know why it's that way, because that's the whole reason why there's confusion in the first place. You're trying to figure something out, mm -hmm. but if you can see the confusion, right? Or if you can see that thing that you feel like you gotta know and you can be like, oh, Duca, <laughs> gotcha, got that one too. Mm -hmm. you've, you've already won, right? Because that's, that's staying, it, that's, you know enough. Well, know that, that it's in that moment, yes, that's in that moment. In, yeah. that, in that moment of, of waking up and seeing this yeah. is Duca, yeah. so that we can deal with it, immediately or you could also say wait a minute i've wake up, woken up enough to know that the direction that i'm heading is into dukkha yeah right right that too yeah okay that if we wake up at that point of contact then the feeling of liking doesn't go into the feeling of wanting and going into the feeling of wanting then so uh an example of that i talk about a rabbit hole or a rat hole from time to time and because that's very excellent uh, teaching of the teacher Samapada, that um, let us say that we see the rat hole. And what we see is actually uh, impacts us so that we notice it, we turn towards it, we look at it, okay? And then we like it. We see it and we like it. All right, and that's all that we've done is just turned and looked, and now we like it. So the next thing that happens is that we take a step towards the rat hole. That's the wanting it. Taking a step in the direction of wanting it, okay? And so now we want it, and the first step into the rat hole is now the clinging. And as we step into the rat hole, we go into now the existence is rat hole. This is where we live. Guess who lives in a rat hole? <laughs> the rat. Okay. That's that's the ditch analogy, basically. That's it right yes. there. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Except that the funny part is, is that what was the process of becoming the rat? The entering and going into the rat hole is yeah. what's created the rat. Yeah. Before the rat went into the rat hole, the rat was just a human being. But when he <laughs> went into the rat hole, that's when he became the rat. Would you say that's also another way to describe ego? 
That's exactly what I'm talking about. The rat yeah. is the ego, okay? <laughs> I am the rat hole. <laughs> this is so funny because, like, everything you're describing, I can see this happening in my own experience. Whenever it happens, I can see it happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, a good example is that, um, well, like, my girlfriend, if she's on her way home, and she hasn't gotten home at the exact same time that she usually gets home at. I start wondering, oh, what she's doing? Where's she going? Is she not coming home? Is she cheating? That right there, that is clinging. That's about to enter the rat hole. So that's in the rat hole. I, You're already in it. <laughs> You're the rat. <laughs> well, yeah. But you I? have thoughts of where is she? She may be doing some hanky panky. That's the rat thinking. Okay, that's the rat thinking, but I think I'm still like by the hole. Like I'm, I'm like getting driven to it. You, I'm you clinging could to really it. Get into it. Yeah. Right. You could kill her when she got home. Right. Before and you I can, even ask her where she's been. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I can see it now and be like, oh, I see that. I'm gonna go the other way. I know that's Duca. I did it mm -hmm. today actually, and when she got home, I didn't say anything, I, and I congratulated myself. Actually, I didn't, but I congratulate myself now. <laughs> well, when she did not come home and you wanted her to come home, and then she did come home, you got what you wanted, but almost always when the guy is waiting for the girl to come home and she doesn't come home until late and then she does come home, he says things like, where have you been? Yep. All yep. right. And... Uh, where have you been? Uh, I've missed you or I have been worrying about you. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Duca. In, <laughs> in Thailand, they have a different uh, way of saying this. And that is in uh, the Thai phrase is Kit Tun Kun, which actually means I have been thinking about you. Mm. Which is not the same as I've missed you or I've worried about you. It's just I've been thinking about you. Mm. Then in fact, while you were missing the girl, if you were actually just thinking about her, then you could think about her in the sense of how much you like her, how much you enjoy being with her, how helpful she is to you, how beautiful and attractive you, she is to you, and how much you appreciate having a relationship with her. And so when she shows up to the door, you could just gush all over her with those kind of thoughts. Well, I'm so glad to see you. I've been thinking about you and missing you and recognizing how beautiful and marvelous a human being you are. And I really appreciate you. And that is a moment for hugging. Mm. OK, that's a moment of Sangha. And so that's the way to treat this rather than treat it with, oh, well, uh, now that she's home, I can feel relieved. Uh, uh -huh. All right, because I have been worrying about her. So this Great reframing, is yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so when she does come home, you can congratulate her. Well, I'm so happy to see you. Right. Yeah, for mm -hmm. sure. Well, okay. you are. You were. I mean, that you were worried about her. Where's she been? Now that yeah, she's yeah, done, yeah. Proven that all my worries were ridiculous. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so now that you've seen that, you can recognize the next time you start to worry that your worries are ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, I'm really starting to see the ridiculous. Yeah, that's really great. Uh -huh. Thank you. I love that. <laughs> I'm going to totally take that on. I love that, actually. That's great. Thank you. Uh-huh. Well, that's um, the way we can deal with people. And instead of saying we miss yeah. you and where have you been, I have been warning and worried about you. That yeah, yeah. actually is telling her that you are now giving her responsibility for how you feel. Yeah, when she's exactly. not there, you feel bad and you only feel good when she comes back. But if you say, I've been thinking about you and saying marvelous things about you, then that is taking that uh, power away from her back to you, making her no longer responsible for how you feel. You are now responsible for how you feel. 
And yeah. your responsibility then exudes from you into you now have the responsibility to her to share her your joy with her. I'm so glad you're home. Exactly. Exactly. And she is not responsible for the way you feel. Exactly. Yeah. But in fact, she hasn't even learned how to be responsible for the way that she feels herself. She's learning. She is learning. I well, love for her to talk to you, song. but she has her own practice. Um, there are several ways to answer that, and one of them is I bet she doesn't. <sighs> well, why do you say that? Um, you haven't even talked to her. How do you know? Well, I'm talking about the human mind. I know. Uh, let us say that uh, people do this a lot with me. They talk about Damarato's method. Uh, Steve J James talks about it like that. Others will talk about it. Damarato don't, don't got no method. I have to give credit where credit is due. And there's nothing here that I personally manufactured. This is not my method. It may be my understanding of the Buddha's method, but that's the, the first point. The second one then would be any student who goes to a teacher, then that student, when he is saying, I practice what I practice, what he's either saying is, is that I'm practicing according to the instructions of the teacher, or I'm not. But whose practice is it anyway? Mm, mm. So yeah. from, just from the perspective of a teacher Samapada, I bet she does not have her own practice. That's delusional. That's delusional thinking. No one has their own practice. That in fact, there's no such thing as a practice. Everybody does a whole bunch of stuff. Well, um, I mean, yeah, we're speaking on the relative level here, right? Because when I talk about my practice, I'm still talking about my practice. But um, you can take the my off and just talk about practice. Well, yeah, of course. I'm using mine um, in there, you know. Yeah. You started that game already. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, but she talked about how she she went to this intensive like therapy program. And what they taught her there was to actually replace unwholesome thoughts with wholesome thoughts and notice the unwholesome thoughts I and let them go. Where they got that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I, she just kind of says that she has like, we do it differently, but you know, well, she doesn't know. What do you mean? She doesn't know. She doesn't know. Well, she hasn't saying. talked to me. She's That's only true. heard what you had to say. That's true. Yeah. And she hasn't discussed what she's been practicing, but when you say that she went to some psychotherapy thing, I, I say, well, I know what's all, all about. And now you're saying that somebody in psychotherapy is said to replace unwholesome thoughts with wholesome thoughts. And I yeah. say, well, I bet I know where they got that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love, I love for you to talk with her, but you know, I'm giving her her own space to, mm -hmm. to, to work that out. And you know what? It's really the more and more I focus on over here, the less dukkha. <laughs> so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll take care right. of that first. So here's the, the uh, one of the ways of looking at that is, is that she's absolutely practicing the correct thing, conceptually at least. Mm -hmm. The question is, how does she identify what's an unwholesome and what's a wholesome thought? And how often does she do that? Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. maybe she only does it when you're trying to get her to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Well, you know, I was going to, I was going to say, um, well, before we go into that, you were talking about the three feelings, right? So there's greed, the ill will, the confusion. 
-hmm. And then the fourth one is the the wise wise feeling. Oh, and wise. I don't think we I don't think we got to that, did we? Yes, we can. In the sense that if you are ignorantly confused, then you're confused. If you're wisely confused, you're satisfied with being wisely confused and you're just waiting for new information. OK, if you are uh, ill will and you're ignorant in your ill will, then you'll blame somebody else or you'll say, poor me or you're a victim or any of that kind of stuff. But if you have wise ill will, then from the position of the Buddha, you can point out wrong behavior and bad actions in others and do it in a kind way, whether they receive it in kindness or not. But that's one of the things about uh, this that is kind of hard for most of the Westerners to understand from the perspective of, let us call it pride. Because in uh, in our culture, uh, pride goeth before fall, that someone is egotistical when they're prideful, that when we uh, when someone is a bully, that means that they're trying to intimidate someone else to do something for the advantage of the bully mm -hmm. that the bully is getting something out of it but a bull is someone who is intentionally pointing out something to someone he is bullying someone but he's bullying them for their own welfare and benefit mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay so this would be wise ill will the wise ill will is not for the person it's for the behavior that needs to be changed. It's interesting because I notice I can see that a lot of times in other people and in myself um, or in this experience. Um, and what I've noticed is that there still is like a tinge of ill will in this experience, even though I can see, oh, I should point that out to them because I know I can cl see clearly that mm -hmm. that is obviously a path of resistance that they're taking. I can see well, the resistance. Let's say that they're I can clearly see they're being this ignorant. Is dukkha. This is suffering. Yeah, yeah is I can see exactly. Okay. I can see clearly this is dukkha. Mm -hmm. Like I know what path they're going down and I want to okay. say something. But sometimes in the saying of that thing, I can see my own intentions of ill will. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, here's an example of does that. Does that make no, sense? It, yes, like it does. Arrogance exactly. or ill will. This, yeah. Okay. So uh, one of the topics that we can look at is Sutta number 86, the Angulimala Sutta. Now, basically, you look at the word Angulimala. You know the word mala. But anguli is the same word as angle, which also comes with our word finger. And basically, Anguli Mala was a, uh, a murderer who had a task to do by his Brahmin teacher. The story is, is that this uh, Anguli Mala guy wanted the daughter of his teacher. And the teacher wanted to have nothing to do with it. And he says, OK, you got to go kill a thousand people and bring me the right baby finger of each person. And when you kill a thousand people, you can have my daughter. Mm. I mean, this is ancient times. We have this kind of ridiculous stuff going on, you know. OK, and so being a good Brahmin student and all of the common, all of that. Well, my teacher told me I got to go do this. And so he's out doing it. During that process, he became quite infamous. And they were hunting him down, but uh, the Buddha actually did track him down. This is how much the Buddha cared. He actually tracked down Angulimala and got him to stop killing people. He became a monk. And then later in the story, the king comes by with all his troops, King Pasanati, and uh, uh, asks the Buddha, have you seen Angulimala? And the Buddha asked him, well, what does Angulimala look like? This, that, and the other thing. And then he says, do you see any of the monks here? And he's pointing right at Angulimala sitting there as a monk and says, do you see who you're looking for here? And, and uh, whether or not King Pasanati recognized Angulimala or not, he did trust the Buddha enough that he actually pulled out his forces and went home. 
because the Buddha actually had pointed out that the problem has been solved. And the problem was solved with rehabilitation, not revenge and not punishment. Yeah, and that's interesting. That's sometimes what comes out in my intentions, revenge or punishment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Especially Which revenge. Means, right, because the bully wants revenge. Mm -hmm. The bull wants rehabilitation. Both of them are based in ill will. One is ignorant and the other one is wise. Does that help? Does that clear that up for you? It does. Yeah. So like, it's interesting though, because, okay, so yesterday my girlfriend and I, we were driving to, um, up to Northern Wisconsin. We went to these really awesome ice castles for Valentine's day. It was beautiful. Um, but as we were driving up there, there was just one complaint after another. And I was listening to like, it was like, oh my God, I don't want to, I don't want to be behind this truck anymore. Oh my gosh, this traffic sucks. Oh, that and would be a very easy thing for you to do is to merely ask her the question of, oh, do you remember that psychological thing, people group that you were talking about? And she uh, says, yeah. And then you say, well, is the thoughts you're having right now, are they wholesome? I know. I know I can do that, but she gets irritated sometimes. Yeah. Okay, I, and then uh, you can say, look at your irritation. I thought that you were practicing having wholesome thoughts. Just <laughs> reminder. I know, I know, yeah. That's, and I, that's, and that's the job that you could have when you don't like that she, what she's doing. You can remind her that she could be doing better. You're right. You're right. I can. But what you I can. wanted to say. And she will not like it the first time. Mm -hmm. You know that story that I've told you. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. But first it ticks you off. Well, it's going to tick her off too. We have to be ready for that. Yeah, you're going to tick her off maybe a dozen times or more. But pretty soon she'll hear it. Yeah, it's like some sometimes though what I notice is I'll I want to be like mm, I want to say something. Sometimes it feels like it I have to compromise my joy or my joy is affected by that. My satisfaction. Well, that's your rule, affected. isn't it? You're that supposed is a rule. to feel how you're told to feel. That is a rule. And um so what I do instead sometimes is I just shake it up. I'm like yeah, man, that truck should just get off the road. Like, why is it even drive? Like, we should just, like, we should just, you yeah, know, take you're all truck drivers That's out of business. That's the other one. Right. Yeah, just put them out of business. I mean, let's be silly about this. Let's yeah. have some fun with this. Let's not get yeah. all serious and really want to hurt truck drivers. We're just trying to get the truck driver. And by the way, the real truck driver has got nothing to do with this. It's a truck driver in my mind. I know. I know. All I'm seeing is the backside of a truck. Well, <laughs> That's all I really see. Well, Dom and Rado's, everything else is mental. It's, it's true. <laughs> well, Dom Rado, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes she'll tell me, she'll tell me that I'm, I'm talking like I'm superior or I'm like condescending. And honestly, uh -huh. sometimes I don't know the difference. I don't know if I'm just oh, pointing well, out to her, wisdom to her so that she can hear. Okay. That she's got some teachings to teach to you. I do. And I do listen and so, yeah. when she. So when she is saying that you're condescending, then you can say, OK. How can I state this without being condescending? And the two of you can work that out so that she doesn't feel like that you're superior and you stop feeling like that you're superior. Yeah. In fact, let's go back to that issue of pride for just a moment. OK. In the sense that uh, in uh, Buddhism, we see things completely different than in Christianity. In Christianity, they say pride is bad and the good would then be humility. Right? Pride and humility. Those are the two concepts that they have with, uh, within Christianity. Mm -hmm. Both of them are losers positions. Mm -hmm. Okay. The winner's position is kind of different in the sense that there is no pride because there's no competition. There's nothing to be prideful about. 
-hmm. because pride is always, uh, in fact, when there is competition, we set it up so that we go in one of two directions. We either lose or we win this um, false competition. And if we win it in our mind, there's pride. And if we lose, then there's jealousy or envy or wanting of revenge. But it's always the competition that's in our mind and people compete. I mean, this is a very competitive society. And so learning when you're competing with your girlfriend, rather than cooperating with her, would be a new way of looking at dukkha. Is is that Uh, you're competing with her rather than cooperating with her. mm. Okay. You can still be the bull. And cooperate. Or Such a good you point. can be the prideful bully, condescending. Yeah. So the point is, is not whether you're going to be uh, pride or envy, because both of those are losers' positions. The better way of looking at it is: Are you going to be a bully? Or are you going to be a bull? Hmm. That's really great. Oh, I, so, so I can start to see. When there's a tendency to compete, I can see that as dukkha too, because mm-hmm. that is com- competition is based in and greed, and it will. Yeah, it's actually, the base of it is fear, delusion, competition, competition. Hmm. It's based upon: Am I good enough? Can I survive? That's part of the. De- uh, that's part of the delusional. Or the uh, the ignorant, hmm. or the confusion that's fearful. Hmm. How dare I let him win? If he wins, that means I die. I mean, chess chess games can be a matter of life or death, especially if you've got a world championship on the line. You're either the world champion and you live, or you get defeated and you're you're dead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But these are all mental attitudes. The reality is, is that it's just a chess game. There's nothing to it. Whether you win or you lose is not the point. The point is, are you enjoying the game? Now, do you think there's a point when uh, Buddha or yourself um, have where just confusion doesn't come up anymore, or at least it comes up much less than it did before? Well, it doesn't come up much. And when it does come up, it comes up wisely in the sense of we know that it's confusion. We know that we don't know the answer to it. And so at that point, that means that we consciously go from leaving it alone because there's nothing to it, until we get new information. And so then we can go out and act if we get the information that we need. Mm. That's one of the reasons why the Buddha, as well as Socrates, ask a lot of questions. Is let's not go with ignorance and, and confusion. Let's go with more questions and more questions and more questions. And you can actually start doing that with, uh, with your girlfriend. That if you watch the videos, you know that I do ask a lot of questions. That's because of confusion. Now, in meditation, the point is, is that when we see the confusion, the answer is right then. We don't need to have the answer to feel good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I need to have the answer to the questions with the students to work with the students. But I want to feel good whether I get the information I need or not. Yeah, and it's interesting because then like part of the confusion is solved even. In that, um, in, in well, that. the pain's out of it. The pain is gone. Yeah, yeah. And just confusion is left because it's wise confusion, and it stops right there. It doesn't go down the rat hole. I've got to know. i got to know. i got to figure it out. Yeah, exactly. So, like, and a good example is sometimes when I'm in that, in the past at least, when I've been, like, really zeroing in on the moment, or if, um, let's say I uh, am uh, 
oh, getting like really like uncomfortable or unfamiliar sensations in my body, mm-hmm. the tendency will be to be like, oh, what's happening? What's happening? Like what's going on with me? And then I don't know. And I think, well, do I keep doing this or do mm-hmm. I relax from it? Like, I really don't know which one to do. Because well, you're trying to get rid of the feeling of confusion. Yeah, exactly. Trying Rather to get rid of the feeling of confusion. satisfied, confused. Exactly. Exactly. That's the new trick is can and, you become satisfied yeah. when you don't know the answer? Yeah. Cool. Cool. <laughs> and that's that's kind of like what I figured out today. Like I, I saw I, I Damarado, it's so cool. I'm literally seeing when that thought comes up, that old rule of like, I gotta keep this up, or there's something I gotta do, or like, oh no, what happened to my joy? Or and I'd be like, wait a minute. This moment, all I need is another moment. I got it right here. I know you. Nothing's wrong. Everything's fine. I gotcha. Like I'm able to like see these things. And 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 um another one that Dan was saying, he's like, you notice like you'll you'll wanna you'll want you'll want and have longing for the these things that aren't present rather than focusing on the things that you do have, the good, the capitalize on the good, on the wholesome. So mm. I'm just like, I'm spending much more time in that and noticing that that's okay. I I don't have to, I don't have to go down those rabbit holes. I've been in them. I know what the dirt smells like. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Rat, been there, done that. (laughs) I know what the dirt smells like. I know what the worms taste like. Okay. I've, I've come up now for a carrot and I'm satisfied with my carrot. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> All right. Well, let's finish this talk now. I think that we've gotten quite a lot uh, without actually rubbing in the poly. We've actually done quite a lot on Petitia Samapada today. Yeah. Great. We've done a lot of it because this Vedana issue, these three kinds of feelings, if they're ignorant or wise, that's the whole show right there. If we have wisdom at the point of contact so that we have control over our feelings, we will never go into dukkha after that, in that moment. Mm, Wow. Awesome. Powerful stuff. Mm -hmm. Powerful stuff. Yeah. And and just to reiterate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And just to reiterate that, that thought, um, it, you said ignorant and then wise feeling. Yeah, ignorant feeling, wise feeling. So when you're wise feeling, you're seeing the tendency to go into ignorant feeling. You're seeing mm-hmm. the tendency of of the thought that arose to go into ignorant feeling. So once you see that, you can be like, oh, oh hello, mm-hmm. I got gotcha. you. Got, All right. got you there. Uh-huh. Congratulations, exactly. success. Amazing that I'm seeing that. And another mm-hmm. thing I'm starting to notice is that the dukkha, seeing the dukkha is my access to freedom right now. It is my access to this moment. It is my access to enjoying, actually. So when mm-hmm. I see dukkha, it doesn't have to be a bad thing. It doesn't have to be a problem. It's actually really important. It's great. It's a grand discovery. It's great. Yeah, when I'm- you see it, that's the best part. Is yeah. that you can see it because if you can see it, you can do something about it. If you can't see it, it'll knock you down. Exactly. And I'm starting to see that more and more that it's becoming more that way. It's becoming more like that reality. So, okay. Well, as we finish, the one last thing is to talk about was with your about your girlfriend is encourage her to continue to investigate what's a wholesome thought. If she's already to the point of, oh, I'm going to have wholesome thoughts and not have unwholesome thoughts, keep reminding her to keep looking. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. I think sometimes sometimes she says to me that it's helpful for her to vent. It's helpful for her to vent and just share. It's just helpful for her to just get it out. Even if it's Uh, unwholesome. We can talk about that later. I've got some points, <laughs> but we'll we can finish that later. I'm sure you do. I, I mean, my answer to it already in my head is like, well, you're kind of engaging with dukkha. You're you're swimming in the mud there. But yeah. there is and the other but, one is that she's slinging it at you also. Mm. That she's got a vent. Say, okay, well, you vent. I'm going to take a hike. I'll be back. <laughs> 
Wow. You you just sit here and vent. You just say anything you want to say, but I'm leaving. <laughs> I don't think she would like that very much. Well, then she would vent while you're on the way out, wouldn't she? <laughs> so you just keep venting. I'm out of here. <laughs> I don't know about that one. I think, you, you know, Dan mentioned, I know you're just being comical, but I think Dan mentioned, he, he mentioned something to me the other day. He said, we have to kind of make a concession eventually you know with the world we're, we're in the world we're doing world where things not everyone is going to think the same way as we do not everyone is going to see the same way as we do they're not going to see as wisely so we need to kind of meet them in the middle because if we're over here sitting on our throne like oh you vent i'm going to take a hike that's not going to go well <laughs> well it's teasing her though yeah it may get her the point is wait a minute is it venting that she needs to do? Because if it's venting she needs to do, she can vent to the tree. Oh, man. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to hear you say that, but <laughs> I, I, think, um, I think what <laughs> helps is for her to be, you know, for me to listen, for me to support her in some way like that. Well, some things we got to get off our chest. Yeah. But that's different than venting. Generally, when we get something off our chest, that means that we've got a problem or we're worried or we've had some wrongdoing we need to confess for. Mm. But venting is often just yelling and in rage. It's just you got to do something with the anger. Yeah, she uh -huh. she does. The psychologist, we can talk about this later, okay? Yeah. Cause there's Lot to say about it but the psychologist yeah. screwed that one up quite big time and now all the people are still following what the psychologist screwed up 50 years ago and we'll talk about that later but venting okay. is not the right thing to do okay. now people will say oh well if i don't vent that means that i'm bottling it up inside the answer to that is we'll pop a cork right now and don't bottle it up inside, just drop it, <laughs> just throw it out. You don't have to throw it out in the sense of venting and you don't have to bottle it up. You can just simply drop it. And she knows how to do that too. According mm -hmm. to her, she says she does that as well. All right. Well, the next time she says she's got a vent, you can say, well, I'm going to take a hike and now you can have a, uh, have a, uh, um, a decision. Are you going to vent or just drop it? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man, that's nuts. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but more about venting later. Let's finish with this one and uh, just see that it's all a silly joke. Just nothing to it. Nothing to it. <laughs> nothing to it. <laughs> okay. All right, Damarado. Thank you. All right. We'll see you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>